Located less than two miles away from the San Diego coastline, Cultivaris Hemp is one of the leading suppliers of young hemp plants to farms across the country, while also providing commercial consulting services to help guide new farmers through the litany of local and federal hemp regulations. So let's have a chat today with the members of the Cultivaris team to see what it takes to run a successful commercial hemp farm. Hi, my name is Josh Schneider, and I'm the CEO and founder of Cultivaris Hemp. Cultivaris Hemp is a young plant producer, so our focus is producing high quality starter plants for the smokable hemp flower market. We have a range of varieties that work in different circumstances, whether you're a field producer outdoors, you're a greenhouse producer, or an indoor controlled environment ag under lights producer. Um, our approach is that we try and figure out the needs of the customer first and match them with the right product so that they can be successful. Our facility here at Cultivaris Hemp is 10 acres of greenhouses and our capacity is, is about 5 million young plants a year. So a lot of that depends on which season the plants are sold in, but most of our plants ship from April to July. But we do have a lot of indoor growers, light dip growers and greenhouse growers that need plants every eight to 10 weeks. And so we service that business through the rest of the year as well. But our total capacity is about 5 million units a year. The reason that I got involved in the hemp industry was because there wasn't a consistent and reliable supply of starter plant material that farmers could depend on. A lot of the seed breeding is really challenging because this is still a new crop and we're still learning to understand the genetics of the plant and how characteristics are passed down when you breed the plants. For instance, two high CBD varieties when crossed together don't always make all high CBD seedlings. So the children, if you will, from those crosses express a variety of characteristics. So by the same token, two high THC strains crossed together can also produce high CBD seeds. This has been a big challenge for the hemp breeding industry because seed breeding is generally a longer timeline that requires more investment in scale and size to get consistent and uniform crops. Think about how long a crop like corn, which started out as a grass growing in Mexico, to the gigantic seeds comparatively to what we have today. So plant breeding is difficult and takes time and we didn't have that much time. Hemp was legalized nationwide in the 2018 Farm Bill and gave federal protection to hemp farmers by descheduling CBD from the controlled substances list and setting analysis limits for what THC levels were legal and how farmers had to get under the legal THC limit. The plant produces a chemical called THC acid or tetrahydrocannabinol acid. This acid, when treated with heat, becomes Delta-9 THC. That's the intoxicating chemical. So what differentiates industrial hemp from THC cannabis? And I always say that it's very similar to apples. You have your Granny Smiths and you have your Golden Delicious. They're both yellow apples, but they have very different characteristics. Hemp is the same plant as cannabis. There is no difference genetically except that high THC strains have been bred for years to produce more THC. And CBD strains have been bred and selected to produce more CBD and less THC. This is a consequence of breeding just like any other crop. When you look at wild citrus, you're not going to see a navel orange. That is the result of many years of selective breeding. Hemp is the same way. The dedicated 
focus on breeding high CBD, CBG, or CBN hemp with the exclusion of THC, we're always selecting for low THC numbers, is really the only difference. The plants look very similar, both in as young plants, as mature plants, and in flower. So it's very difficult to tell them apart with anything besides a lab test. The real challenge for farmers initially was deciding which varieties to plant. And the seed breeding early on was very inconsistent and continues to be very inconsistent. And so my background in ornamental plant breeding and young plant production led me to believe that there would be a substantial market for clonal propagation, just like in the THC market, where you take a single variety and you take cuttings of the variety and you make lots of mother plants and then you harvest cuttings each week and you root those cuttings and each rooted cutting grows into a new plant that's an exact copy of the original. That provides the farmer with consistency and predictability. Now the challenge is, it's a little more expensive than growing from seed, but you're not at the risk of having male plants pop up and you're not at the risk of having the plant turn out to be very high in THC. The challenge with high THC plants is not necessarily legal, it's that at the end of the season, when you do compliance testing, your crop may turn out to be what we call hot, having too high of a Delta 9 THC to be legally harvested. And so the state or the county will issue a destruction order, meaning that all of your investment and all of your time is for naught because the crop has to be destroyed. Clonal propagation allows you a more consistent, uniform and predictable expression of all cannabinoids and growth habit and performance under a range of growing conditions. And so here at Cultivaris Hemp, our focus is in developing varieties that perform beautifully in the ground, but also grow well in greenhouses and are excellent for smokable flower. Farming is really hard work. So our team works with farmers very closely to make sure that they've fully considered the ramifications of every decision they make, that they've done all the planning that is necessary so that they can be assured that they have thought through most of the potential problems before they even put a plant in the ground. And what that means is they're gonna sleep better at night. I always tell my farmers that the most important nutrient is actually the shadow of the grower. If you look at your plants every day, you will notice problems before they become problems and you'll learn the plant. Walking your field, walking your greenhouse is critical and so our team works to support the farmers to answer their questions, to train them in advance for what to look for, to help educate them on what they need to be thinking about ahead of problems. When the weather changes they'll often call us and say how should we do this, what should we do next, we're seeing this problem with the yellowing leaf or we're seeing caterpillars. So we help guide them towards sustainable, environmentally responsible solutions for fertilization, for pest and disease management, and for harvesting and processing. And then we work to try and help the farmers sell the flour that they produce or the biomass as they have it available. And we try and match them with buyers. We really work to support the farmers throughout the process because there's a lot that isn't yet known. Universities were prohibited from doing research on hemp until the 2018 farm bill. So it was really the 2019 season that was the first season where universities yeah. could get involved in hemp and not risk losing federal funding. And so the data that's coming out of the academy today is really interesting and helpful. And I think we're really at the very early stages of hemp knowledge. And so as the market develops, as the regulations calm down, as we have fewer issues of reefer madness regulation where some counties in California think that hemp is just a scam to grow illegal THC. Once some of these things calm down and people begin to realize that hemp is just another agricultural product, the market can find some balance. Eventually, most CBD and other cannabinoids will be a byproduct of food and fiber hemp production which is grown from seed at between a half a million and a million plants per acre. These are 
plants that are both male and female. They produce grain, the seeds that you buy as hemp hearts. They produce flowers that are the precursor to the seeds. And they produce the fiber that comes from the stalk. This tri-crop, as we call it, is the future of hemp. The only thing that these plants can't produce is smokable flour, and that's our specialty. But the revolution in manufacturing, in plastics production, and in all of these areas is coming because of food and fiber hemp, and there are so much opportunity for research and for large-scale farming across a range of places that I'm really excited to see the development of this process. This is our clean stock mother plant house, and you can see lots of the plants behind me. These mother plants produce between 20 and 50 cuttings per week. Those cuttings are harvested, and they're moved to the mist house where they're stuck into trays where they root, and then they move to another greenhouse and harden off before they're shipped to our customers. There are many thousands of plants here, and so the capacity for this greenhouse over the season is around 750,000 to 1.2 million plants per year. One of the most important issues in guaranteeing that the starter plants are free of disease is to start with clean stock. And how that works is we test the starting plant from which all mothers come. So we either put that plant in tissue culture and run it through a pathogen elimination process or we test the plant using qPCR and RNA-seq technology and look for virus and viral particles. The approach to that is that if you start with a clean plant, you're much more likely to be successful later on in the crop cycle. So our goal is to give our customers a plant that has been through a clean stock system. We're here in this clean stock greenhouse, which has insect exclusion screening, and our people operate in the greenhouse with masks and gloves and gowns so they don't spread diseases. There are no viruses or viroids that will affect the plant negatively in the growing season if the plant contracts that virus in that season. So as long as you start with a clean plant, you're much more likely to have a successful grow. One of the big challenges right now is doing crop planning. So it's not like we have millions of hemp plants on the shelf. We have to actually figure out what we're gonna grow starting in August of the year before we sell the plants because we have to plan the stock, we have to plan the space, we have to choose which varieties we're gonna feature and which ones are gonna be de-emphasized. So right now it's a lot of <laughs> hoping for the best and rolling the dice. Um, it really is a challenge because the farmers often wait until the last minute especially given the changes in the regulatory structure, they often aren't sure until they pull the trigger. That, that delay in getting us orders in January or February or even November and December is, is substantial and creates some supply chain challenges for us, but we're really trying to work with our farmers all year long so that we know what their expectations are and we can plan our crop according to our customers' needs. So here I am in the middle of our mother stock. This is a variety called Skipjack, bred by our friends at Maristem Farms in Vermont. It's an excellent variety and it's very popular. Um, these plants are so lush and healthy. It's like a sea of hemp mother stock. And so this is where the ladies stick the cuttings. So the tables come down with trays on them. They take the cuttings out of the styrofoam boxes where they've been in the cooler overnight. That helps make them more turgid or stiff so that they can go into the tray more easily without a risk of breaking or bending them and damaging the cutting. But they stick the cuttings, they fill a table, cover it, and then it moves over into the mist house on the rolling benches. Draminector is weaning tissue culture of their new Gerberas. And so that's what they're doing down there. Those are the same cut flowers that you saw. These are the tissue culture versions that come from a lab in the Netherlands and they get weaned in those little tents. So here we have plants under the fabric, which keeps the humidity high, but doesn't require a lot of water on the leaves. Cannabis doesn't like to be wet. And so this little tent of what we call floating row cover or reme really helps the plants to root well without rotting and speeds the rooting. So the plants are stuck 
and then they come in here and they're in here for about a week to 10 days and once they start rooting then they move into the other parts of the greenhouse that have less moisture and more sunlight helping them acclimatize to be ready for outdoor planting. This is one kind of boom that's used. It moves over the plants on a, on a programmed schedule and sprays them with misted water to keep them from wilting. And so the boom is a real important part of rooting because it allows us to keep the plants from wilting while they're growing roots. And since they don't have roots, you have to prevent them from losing all their moisture. And so the boom helps. You've got several different kinds, but it's on a timer or a brain and it moves back and forth as needed. These plants are our young plants that have come out of the mist. Some of them still have the tents over them so that we can cover them to increase the humidity so that the plants can root. So this is our, our young plant production area after the cuttings are stuck in the greenhouse. These are some of the teens that we have getting ready to ship. This is a really nice, well-branched plant um, that is what we call ready to flower. So a grower can plant this in a controlled environment ag setting and it will be exploding out of the ground with lots of good growth and really it's just a it's just a great way that's actually skipjack. Yeah.